So um, thanks for um, realising that this session is on. Um, as you probably saw, most of the signs around the place say TV decided. Um, it was decided, it will be me. So, um, so my name's David Breller. I'm a senior technical evangelist at Microsoft. Um, and what I focus on mostly is on blockchain. So at Microsoft, I cover blockchain across the entire um, Asia-Pacific region. So I work with our major customers um, around the APAC region. So they've sent me off to South Korea, uh, Singapore, Thailand, Philippines, etc. And what I do is I go into these big companies and I talk to them about what blockchain is, uh, how we can implement it into their business, which, um, business, uh, which use cases make sense. 90% uh, of the uh, blockchain stuff that's come to me, I've had to say that's a terrible idea, don't do that. Let's think about how to do this slightly differently. So, um, quick show of hands. How many people here are developers? Cool, okay, that's great. So I wasn't too sure um, where to uh, position this talk. So I wasn't sure if I should make it not technical or a bit more technical. So last night I took out a bunch of technical slides just in case. Um, I've talked to some people who said, no, make it technical. So um, last session I was adding in back in some of the slides. So to cover off um, how I'm going to be doing this talk, uh, because we can't talk about some of the use cases now unless we've got some context of what blockchain is. So I'm going to start off today just, um, well, there's a few things that I'm trying to do here. Um, because blockchain is such a massive thing, um, I've literally got slide decks in here, which um, are two or three hour slide decks, which I go through deep dive, what is blockchain, et cetera, et cetera. We've only got uh, 45 minutes left, and so my goal for today is just to introduce what blockchain is, just to let you guys understand some of the use cases which you might be able to use it for, but most importantly, just get you excited about why you probably want to pay some attention to the space. So my agenda for today, I'm going to start off with just what is blockchain. I'm going to cover off what uh, blockchain generation 1.0 was, and why you should just ignore that and go straight to blockchain version 2. Um, once you, that's going to take about the first half of the presentation. In the second half, I'm going to cover off some use cases of gaming. I went and um, came up with a couple of different ways we could use it for digital item assets, ownership, uh, durable consumable items, etc. Um, and then I'm from Microsoft. Why am I here? Why do we care about blockchain? I'll put it right at the end, so if we run out of time, it doesn't matter. But um, I'll talk about what we've got up on Azure and how you can utilize some of that in what you're doing. So. What is a blockchain? Um, there, you guys are probably, well, show of hands, how many people own some Bitcoin? Hey, cool. And so blockchain is just at one implement, uh, Bitcoin is just one implementation of blockchain technology. So just like you've got database technology and you have uh, Microsoft SQL and uh, Postgres and all those other types, same thing with blockchain. Blockchain's a tech, Bitcoin is one of them, Ethereum's another. Dogecoin is another, they're all just different implementations. But I'd like to start off with this uh, example to explain why we're coming up to these digital cryptocurrencies. So if we're going to go and buy a phone, so back before the days of the internet, if you want to go and get a phone, you'd have to go over uh, in person, physically meet with a person, there you go, they meet together, um, you're going to exchange money, and they're going to hand you a phone. Yay! Only problem with that is you have to be physically present with a person. Um, you, so if you have to go, um, if you're in different villages, you have to go to another village. Um, if you're here in Australia, you have to go down to Meyer or David Jones because we don't have any good e-commerce. Um, we all have to do it in person. And so then we moved on to online trading where we could just send them money via uh, bank transfer and then they will send us the device. Okay. I'm telling guys what you know. But what happens when we send them the money, but they decide not to send you the phone? And at this point, that's why we have trusted third parties. And so that's why we use things like banks and PayPal and eBay. So if there is any arguments about, hey, they didn't send this device, they didn't give me what I bought, then you've got someone who can go and resolve that for you. And so a lot of our commerce and online stuff comes um, with this idea of needing trusted third parties. So one of the promises of blockchain is instead of having to trust people, because people are dicks, we can just trust technology. 
Um, so, sorry, if we put, <laughs> so if we take our trust out of people and we put it into the blockchain, um, we can actually use a blockchain to go and replace these um, third parties who were just there sucking value um, because they, we couldn't trust people. Um, and so they were taking a 20% cut, 10% cut, 5% cut because they were being the middle party. So what we could do on a blockchain, we could put something called a smart contract there. We can go and deposit our money into it and the, the seller can see that the money is sitting there inside of that smart contract. They can then send you the phone once you've got it, um, then from that smart contract, which is acting like an escrow account, but instead of being a third party person doing the escrow, it's now just all being automated via technology. And so the receiver says, yep, I got the phone, um, you can release the funds. The seller says, yep, cool, please release me the funds, and the funds have been returned. Now, that's a happy path, and in the happy path, they've now saved a whole bunch of money. Um, no one's taken the cut for being a middleman, the technology just did it for you, and you may pay a couple of cents just to power that smart contract. So um, it removes all the merchant fees, money transfer happens instantly, um, as soon as the, the next block is mined, and everyone's happy. Now, that's in the best case scenario, everyone saves money, but you may still have issues where, well, what if there's a dispute? Um, someone says the phone didn't come, uh, who gets the money? So we can just have the smart contract up front say, if we are going to have, if there is an, a disagreement, then we both agree that we'll use an, um, a third party arbitrator. We'll have, to, um, whoever um, was wrong, they have to pay for it, but in a happy case, we can save money. But there are still mechanisms we can put in place to resolve when there are conflicts and issues. Um, so that's one example where we're getting rid of third parties. Um, another example is for when companies are interacting with each other. And this is where a lot of the work I've been doing with Microsoft, with blockchain, with these companies, have been in this scenario where we've got multiple companies working together. And it's just their back-end business to business working. So usually we're going to have some type of message system working between the two companies. They're going to send messages, and no matter what we do around trying to make sure these messages are correct and they go through, no matter what, these things just get out of sync, and we always need to reconcile them. And a lot of business processes that happen with, between companies is usually just comes down to this reconciliation. Um, that each company in their own databases have a different definition of what um, the current state of the truth is. They have lots of arguments. If it comes down to a purchase order or something like that, arguments come around where I ordered 100 widgets, no, I ordered 10, no, you owe us $10,000, no, it's only five. A lot of it comes down to this. So usually as software engineers, we go, wait, let's just put like um, one um, service in the center and both the companies can just work on it. And we've only got one database that way we've only got um, one source of truth at any point in time. Techno technologically, that works perfectly. In a business environment, it doesn't work because who hosts that? Now you've got the arguments. Both companies have a vested interest in trying to be the one that is hosting it. Um, and then whoever hosts it, the other company will never fully trust uh, what is in that database. So you can kind of see some parallels here with things with your own game developments, with your own game servers. If you're trying to do it with multiple companies, um, then who, who owns that, that um, the back-end servers for that? If you do try to have a central place, then um, who, who do you trust? So if you're doing something with Valve, then where are the game servers going to sit? So let's bring the blockchain in. Um, and again, this is what I do with a lot of the companies. We, instead of um, trying to set up a um, centralized database, we put in a centralized blockchain, um, a private blockchain between those companies. Now the blockchain is a source of truth and they can go and send messages to there. So again, we're getting rid of the trust in people, of people having to trust each other, because we can just trust the underlying blockchain technology and it all just works. So, some of the things that we like about the blockchain is that um, that top one, you get rid of third parties. Again, getting rid of the trust. We can reduce fraud because we can see that these transactions happened. So this is why Bitcoin works. So people can't uh, fraudulently spend to, um, a Bitcoin twice because you can only spend a Bitcoin once because everyone can see who is the current owner of this Bitcoin. So the same thing you could do with game items. Hey, who's the current owner of this sort of Ubinus? It belongs to Jim. Um, 
So you can't have fraudulence. Um, efficiency and speed. So there's a joke that it's, quick, it's quicker to send an anvil to China than it is to send money to China because to send money to China, you go through your local bank to another bank, um, over to um, the SWIFT network, over to, to China until it eventually goes down through. <laughs> um, and here are the four key things about blockchain. Um, it's cryptographically authentic. So this means everything underneath the covers is happening with cryptography. So that's where all the security comes from. Um, it's distributed, so there are many copies of it over the, whoops, over the network. Shared, so this is, so short, distributed on many computers, but shared means it's an open platform where multiple companies can go and hook into it together. And so if you're um, one company which is doing um, an esports game and you've got other companies who are doing esports games, maybe you could have a shared blockchain where you can go and have your esports e stats there. So instead of just having um, ladders per game, you've now got a ladder for esports in general where how they go on Dota and on LoL gets them a higher ranking. Um, so I've got an, about another five more slides on what um, the underlying how Bitcoin works um, before we start talking about other blockchain -y stuff. So um, how the blockchain looks under the covers, it looks like a giant ledger. So if you've ever done accounting, it kind of looks like a giant accounting ledger. So um, David had five Bitcoin, he sent it to, to Jeff, Jeff sent one of these Bitcoin to whatever. The point of it is that it's like um, a SQL database. You've got a giant SQL transaction log where you could go and replay every transaction from, from the beginning right, right to, through to now, and you're going to get what the current state of the database is. So it's the same thing here. You can go and play back through every single tra um, blockchain transaction from um, block zero right through to now, and you're going to get um, the current state of the blockchain network, which is how many Bitcoin um, each person has or who currently owns that sort of Ubernus. Um, and how this works under the covers is it all is um, public-private key cryptography. So when you go and create a public-private key pair, um, you get a public and a private key. So the idea here is your public key is um, your account number. So here we've got um, Ethereum. So the person's public key, um, we just say it's one, two, three, four, and they've currently got 50 Ether. Um, this account has zero. So we could put a message on the network that says, hey, send five from this account to that account, and by itself, that message, no one will trust it. Because anyone could try to say, hey, try and move something from this account over to the other account. Where the magic of blockchain comes in is the only way that this message is valid is if it's been signed with a private key which is associated with that public key. So because we're saying send money from this public key to that public key, the only way it's valid is if we sign it with that associated private key. And because of that, everyone goes, okay, the owner of it is really trying to move on those, uh, move on those assets. So now we can go and update everything. So same thing here with gaming items. Um, against my account, I can have a whole bunch of swords, um, elite armor, and then, and because they're associated to me, I can now do things to them. Um, one last aspect we need to talk about is hashing. So hashing is where you can take a whole big piece of data, and then you bring it down to just a 32-byte um, unique signature. And the idea is if we change a single thing, like just change a single number from five to six, we massively change what the resulting hash is. And that's how we can go and secure things. Um, and this is one of the reasons why, we'll see in a minute, why blockchain is secure, because if someone tries to change something, we get a massive difference which just cascades down all the way through. So where blockchain gets its security from is um, from its name, blockchain. The idea is that we've got a chain of these blocks. And what goes into each, each one of these blocks is, so a block starts off with a pointer to the address of the block before it. So it's just like a giant linked list. Then we're gonna go and put in some transactions. So what happens is, as you may see in Bitcoin, when you try and send Bitcoin from one person to another person, you see that it's there pending waiting because Submitting a transaction doesn't do it instantly. 
Submitting a transaction just puts it into the giant pool of transactions to happen eventually. And so each block, the, peop uh, the miners would go pick out some of the transactions that's in the pool of waiting transactions. They'll go and put them into the next block to be created. And we then put in a random number of a nonce. Then we run that hashing algorithm. So we go and hash this entire block and we get a, just a random hash as we would expect. So the, fi the final rule for what makes this a valid block is that it must be below a certain number. So it must start off with, um, so it has to be below 50 kajillion, um, which is a whole bunch of zeros and then we've eventually got like five or 50 kajillion. So here we can see it's much bigger than that number. So we go put in a new random number we generate the new hash, it's still way too big. And so because there's no deterministic way to try to generate hashes, it's just kind of random. The only way to get a valid hash, is we're just going to have to keep on changing that random number, just try every random number, keep on hashing it until we eventually find a random number that when we hash, it's below a certain number. And so that's why you've got all those computers sitting there just ran, um, crunching through brute force and just trying to find the correct number and then they'll eventually find it. Once they find it, they then go and send it off to the network, and then we start again on the next block. And here you can see my amazing PowerPoint animations. Ooh. Now, because it takes so much work to um, generate one of those blocks, um, it takes, um, what, how much, they say more electricity is spent on mining Bitcoin than some small nations spend on their electricity now. Um, there's so much computing power being, not wasted, um, spent securing this financial system. Um, and so if we build it up, and we build up a couple of blocks, so we've, we've got a, a kind of long blockchain now, um, that's okay. But it would have taken a lot of computing work to find enough valid hashes to get up to this far. And this is where you hear that um, blockchain is uh, immutable because you can't change what happened. So you can always change the state. State is mutable, but it's just the history of these transactions are immutable. You can never go back and try to change one of these. So back here where I sent um, five Bitcoin from me to Jim, um, Jim can't go in, try to modify this transaction to say 100. And I'll show you why. Because we've got all these valid, blo valid blocks, so if he were to go and try to replace that transaction back in the history, put in a, a new transaction, that means that this hash is invalid, so we're going to have to regenerate that hash. But if that means, once we've generated that hash, because it's a linked list, it means that now that's no longer pointing at that, so we've got to update this, which means we've got to regenerate that hash and just cascades up the entire tree. So we'd have to try to have more hashing power, more computing power than the whole entire rest of the network to try to um, generate enough of these to try to catch up with um, where we are currently. And we'll never catch up because the rest of the network are there mining all of the new blocks. So that's where the security and blockchain comes in. And it's meant to stop us from hackers. So hackers aren't able to... <laughs> <laughs> um, I took a whole bunch of these slides to my talk, which was uh, blockchain is cyberpunk, um, which is why you can still see a Japanese neon future um, thing going on in here. Um, and so it protects us a couple ways. One, they can't just go back and modify history. And two, um, if it was just a single database, you could have an employee that goes in and just modifies it and just gives them... Um, one of their guild mates an extra 10,000 gold. They can't do that because it's no longer one database. It's now but databases on everyone's computer. So they have to try to simultaneously hack everyone's computer at the same time, which is a lot harder than just hacking a local SQL server on, um, inside of your business. So one big takeaway here is the internet, the web is the internet of data, but all the data that's on there, we can't trust it. And so the whole point of blockchain is that blockchain is internet of trust. And we're going to see coming along um, in the next couple of years, blockchain being used more and more and more for that trust of, sure, there's this data on the internet, but do we trust it? Yes, it came from the CSIRO. Um, do we trust this data? Yes, it was signed and certified by Valve. We know that this is correct. Now, with blockchain, um, there's a few different scopes, uh, a few different dimensions of um, how... Um, I talk to customers about this. So we've got the scope. So is what you're trying to build, is it a consumer-to-consumer -consumer app? 
for a business to consumer app. If you guys are game devs, probably business to consumer. Um, you're building something which consumers are going to be uh, purchasing off you. And so the uh, blockchain technologies there in a public setting um, are going to be Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, if it's something which is business to business, it's going to be Ethereum, Quarter, or Hyperledger. So um, all the companies that I'm working with, we're using Ethereum um, because it works in both the public and a private um, space, and all the open source tooling is currently working there. Um, there are multiple ways you can secure it. What I just showed was called proof of work, and that requires lots and lots of computing power. If you're, um, it's good for some ca use cases, but if you've only got 10 nodes, um, someone can easily overpower you with more computing power. So you'd use something like proof of authority, proof of identity, so only certain people are allowed to create new blocks. But most importantly, there's generation one and generation two blockchains, which I'll talk about right now. So the 1.0 blockchains were the first ones that came out. These were the ones who pioneered it. So this was Bitcoin, Dash, Zcash, Litecoin, Namecoin, Doge, etc. And the thing with all of these are they, they are all single use case. It's usually we have this one type of digital asset and that's it. People can go and transfer that one type of digital asset between each other, but they were all single use case blockchains. And if we mirror it back to um, a traditional like 3 tier architecture, um, how we've got a um, UI front end, we've got um, back end business server logic, then we've got a data store, which would be a SQL server. Blockchain 1.0 kind of sits in that space where we've got the current state of um, that giant distributed database, um, how many Bitcoin does David have, how many Bitcoin does this other person have, but it's just a data store. If we want to interact with it, we've got all of our logic sitting external to it going and interacting with it. And this is why people had issues with it, because although the blockchain itself may be nice and secure, you'd have to trust the business that's running this business logic on your behalf and they could still be dodgy and go and take um, all of your Bitcoin off you if you go through their servers. But um, 1.0 has a whole bunch of great use cases. Now version 2, which we'll see soon, um, is a superset. So everything that we're about to see here, version 2 can do. So we, I'll say again, go straight to version 2. But um, I'll show you what you can do with some of these right now. And they come down to three main things um, around asset ownership, um, saying that something, proving that something happened at a point in time, and provenance. So ownership is the one that's probably the most applicable here um, with digital assets. So we can track things like money, Bitcoin, um, we've already talked about, trading card games, uh, for Magic the Gathering, proving that you own these cards, in-game items, and physical assets like cars, apartment, land titles. I'll talk about it more when I get to the gaming section. Um, attestation is for proving that something happened or did happen at this point, or, or this was the truth at this point in time. So we can do that for when we someone signs a contract, like a home loan, we can go and put that home loan up onto the blockchain, the signed version, so later when the bank tries to change it from 2% uh, to 5% interest, then we can go, no, 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 look, I've I can prove that the original said 2% because it's still up on the blockchain. Um, and you can use that for birth certificates and things like that. Um, provenance. Provenance is proving the origins of something. So we can do this to go and prove where um, all the parts of a smartphone came from, for example. So to, we can go and prove that this um, smartphone wasn't made with any um, conflict minerals because we can go and track the minerals came from this mine, it went and got turned into steel at this mine, it got turned into a, a motherboard here. The motherboard, CPU and RAM each got individual um, uh, component numbers, So, if we, um, which are all unique hashes. If we go and put all those hashes together, without, now I get out this um, new smartphone, uh, the unique hash for this smartphone, which is made up of all of the assets which made it. So we can do it for a smartphone. We could do it for a car. So we can prove that a car is still an original car and hasn't um, had anything replaced in it. Because we could go manually check all the serial numbers in the car, manually hash it, and check that that hash matches what we expect for that car up on the blockchain. Um, and, and it's great for things like um, 
In Australia, we've got really good food security. People trust us, which is why we see countries like China buying lots of our milk powder and sending it back home um, because they trust our milk powder. And so being able to um, prove the provenance of this milk powder, it came from this Australian farm, got turned into milk powder, got shipped from Australia to a port in Hong Kong. So then in China, when they're there and trying to buy it off the shelf, they could scan it and then see the entire provenance train, um, chain of where it came from. Um, also good for things like fair trade coffee. So those are three quick um, things that we can use. Um, asset ownership, provenance and attestation. Now blockchain, so blockchain one came out eight years ago roughly and not much happened with it. It wasn't until blockchain two came out about two years ago that people have been starting to give this um, more attention. So if we go back to our three tier architecture, now it's covering a little bit more. It's now um, covering that business logic bit. And so this is why now enterprises and big companies are now starting to pay attention because now they can trust this a bit more. So to go back into the software development paradigm, um, we've now got, it's a data store, but how in a um, SQL server you could have store procedures and the store procedures are the only way to go and update that data. Kind of the same thing here. We've now got smart contracts, so we can go and call the smart contract and it will go and change data on our behalf. So now if we have multiple companies or multiple parties, um, they can all go and call this one smart contract and they can all go and inspect the smart contract and know that it's gonna do what they expect. So they know that um, how the data gets modified, they know it's all correct. How smart contracts look like is um, literally like this. So it kind of looks like JavaScript. Um, so whatever Boolean logic um, you can do inside of JavaScript, you can do inside of a smart contract. So instead of, um, so if you're using ECMAScript 6, instead of class, we've got the word contract. Um, our contract has uh, variables and those variables are there and they're persisted. Um, and then we've got functions. So then we can say, um, we can go and invoke these functions and the only way that these variables will get updated is through our logic here. So we can go and inside of our logic, we can check, hey, is a person who's calling the smart contract, are they the owner of the sword? Yes, they are the owner. Okay, let them transfer it to someone else. And then we can go and um, set the variable for the current owner of the sword to someone else. But the only way that we can do it is through a, um, the smart contract functions where we've gone and put all of that um, logic on top of it. And another big thing about this is because we now have these programmable um, smart contracts we, and then they are Turing complete, anything you could have done with a 1.0 blockchain, you can now do as a single smart contract instead of inside of um, uh, 2.01. So you can go and replicate the entire Bitcoin network inside of just a single smart contract on a 2.0 network. So that's why I say just go straight to 2.0. And the three main ones are Ethereum, Corda, um, R3, which is from the R3, and Corda is just for banks, so ignore that one. Um, and Hyperledger, um, Hyperledger was made by IBM just for enterprises, just for um, private, in, uh, private consortiums. So for you guys, um, it's mostly going to be Ethereum. Now, one final thing to talk about is um, co contract-oriented architecture. The idea of this is just um, contracts can call other contracts. And so you can do contracts as microservices. So you can have each smart contract do a specific thing. So it may be this contract is about um, asset ownership. This contract is about combining two items to make a new item. So for say um, crafting, um, take two items and turn into another one. Another contract which allows you to do uh, apply skins to your items. So you can still do um, like microservices and they can all call each other. So key takeaways, um, if, if you take nothing else away from this, is some of the um, key use cases for blockchain is around using it as a trusted data source between multiple parties. Because we put our trust in the blockchain, in the technology, not in people or in, or in business agreements because it's all codified inside of the blockchain. It's about removing um, the need for third parties, um, so getting rid of um, uh, people that are there as escrows. 
Um, it's good for testing something happened, approving ownership, there's a shared API, and just go straight to using Ethereum. Um, not really relevant for this one. Okay, cool. So, how am I going for time? Yep, I'm right about where I expected to be. So, that was um, what um, blockchain is, just a level set, some use cases for it. Um, so, the rest of this time is basically blockchain examples for gaming. Um, so, I've got four broad categories I came up with this one. Um, one around item ownership, another for land ownership, um, things around trading, and then um, using blockchain as an ability to build up an ecosystem around your game. So, item ownership. So, if you were in the last talk, there's a bit of um, talk around in-app purchases and durable and consumable items and things like that. And so blockchain is a great use case for doing that. So um, we're all nerds here, so most of us have probably played Magic the Gathering or some type of tradable card game. And so I used to play this a lot in school. Uh, and so we'd, we'd go get our booster packs, get enough cards, and then we'd go into the schoolyard and we'll go and play it. And because you were there in, per yeah, you guys are noticing that they're not real magic cards. <laughs> um, and so we could prove while we're playing and battling someone else in person, we could prove that we own these cards because we physically got them in our hand and we're able to go and show them and play them. And so that's okay, but then how do you do that online? Now, we, d we don't have this kind of concept um, online of having uh, physically owning something and then proving that you've got it um, online. But we could do something like each of these um, cards, maybe on the back they've got a unique QR code. Um, so the first person to go and scan that QR code up on the blockchain, they get that card assigned to them. So now you can go and um, trade those cards with other people because on the blockchain we can prove who the owner is of this digital card. And now when you go and do a battle with someone else, you can prove that you own that card because they can go look it up on the blockchain and see that you own it. So we could do it for this. Um, a cartoon I used to watch when I was younger was um, Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah. Um, and in Yu-Gi-Oh, um, they'd have the thing where they'd go and they'd be um, fighting with big uh, 3D holograms in the middle and they'll be fighting each other. So we could start to do the same type of thing where we could go and battle other people in person now, but we don't have to have the physical items with us anymore. Um, our two phones could just go check the blockchain. Yep, they own it. Okay, let's start battling. Same thing with Pokemon battles. So we could go have those Pokemon battles and prove, yes, this is my team, you can prove it, uh, you can prove your team. So any of those type of things. Um, another one would be um, Mega Man, Mega Man X, um, where in that cartoon, they would go and fight, they'd have consumable items where they could go and plug it in. Same type of thing. You could now go and battle in, battle in the schoolyard, have those consumable items to power it up just for that battle, and you're still able to prove it all by the blockchain, not with physical items anymore. So going along that type of thing, um, so that was one way to bring it from physical over to digital world, but we could still do it just for the online only games like Gwent, Hearth, Hearthstone, um, or uh, Dota, they just got on board, Dota the collectible card game. Um, so all of those, same thing. You can, uh, the people can now go and own, um, own the cards inside of their own um, blockchain wallet and then they could go bring it around um, and battle. So one question here may be, well, at the moment, the, um, the game studio who's running this already have a database. The database is already um, keeping track of uh, each person, which cards as they have. Will blockchain bring any value to this? I would say yes. Um, one thing is, sure, Gwent is one implementation of what you can do with those cards, but maybe other uh, people, third party people will go and say, well, cool, if you've got these Gwent cards, um, sure, you can use them for that game, but maybe someone will make a dating simulator game and you can use your Gwent cards as um, the actors that are inside of your dating simulator. So there may be other ways for those digital items to go and reuse them in other scenarios. So Team Fortress 2. In Team Fortress 2, you've got uh, your backpack. And in your backpack, you can go and craft these items, um, combine them, you can trade them, and it's kind of big money at the moment for people buying and selling these things. 
And because some of these people's accounts, um, some of these items are worth thousands of dollars, some people's accounts have tens of thousands of dollars inside of their Steam account now. And so they see a lot of Steam hacking happening, people um, using malware to try to get into their accounts. And it's because we've got um, one company uh, keeping track of who's got the um, ownership of these items. So if we move the concept from that one company uh, having a single database with who's the owner, if we move our mindset across from that over into digital assets, just like with Bitcoin, um, so you've got a, a wallet which has all of your Bitcoin, we could move the same kind of concept over to this. We've now got a wallet where we've got all of our digital gaming items in it, and so now I can um, keep that secure. And we have that secured by many more things than just um, Valve have. We've got um, cryptographic security over it. We can do um, hardware um, uh, signing, so you need to have a, a hardware dongle that you press to sign it. All that type of stuff you can now layer on top of it. Plus, we get the advantages of uh, being able to layer on other things like um, third-party trading sites. Now, um, one really great resource that I used early on when I was learning um, blockchain development was um, someone actually ran through the thought experiment of what if we took the Team Fortress 2 backpack and tried to put it onto the blockchain. So if you want, if, um, it's about a 20 minute read through. So um, block, block, what was it? blockchainbackpack.org, jump up onto there, um, they go through and he just builds up a smart contract step by step. Okay, how do we go about um, having a backpack and keeping track of all the items this person has? Great, we've got that, now how would you layer on the other services? How we allow them to craft and combine two different items? How do we go and allow trading between one person to another person? How do we go and apply consumables on top of this, like um, paint cans and things like that? And he again does that as microservice contracts, which each do a specific thing. And he showed how then other people could go and create their own smart contracts, which would go and interact with these smart contracts to do more things. So you can go and do um, what pricing lookups and things like that, seeing how much your backpack is worth, going and setting up um, online um, trading sites, etc. And so again, just to emphasize how much some of these digital items are worth now. So in Counter-Strike Go, you've got skins for your gum. And some of these skins at the moment are going for, I just took the screenshot this morning to prove my point. Some are going for two grand US per skin. Um, so we now have these digital assets which are worth a lot. So again, trying to shift our mindset across to, okay, why don't we turn these into real digital assets which um, the people own and then they can start owning it as if it was any other um, real life expensive thing. Now, um, you can try and do this yourself, but there are a couple of people, um, companies who are trying to do this as a service. They're trying to do um, on the blockchain item, digital items and assets on the blockchain. Um, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, one is called Block V. Another one is Free My Vunk, as in their virtual junk Vunk. Um, so you could, yeah. Um, this one though, they came out um, really big at a conference um, last year, January 2016, and I checked their blog and they haven't done anything since then, so I think they're dead now. <laughs> but the point is just there's lots of stuff happening. We're only just at the very tip of this blockchain um, hysteria wave, uh, so in the next two years or so we'll start to see a lot more companies come on. But at the moment everything is happening uh, business to business back end. There isn't too much happening public facing yet because everyone's too scared to be the first one to mess up publicly. But we will start to see soon more and more happening. Um, so virtual items is cool, but we can also do the same thing as virtual land. And so instead of um, how we say this sword is currently owned by this person, we can say this plot of land is owned by someone. Um, and so I've actually got a um, side project where I plan to go and um, just do a little Minecraft mod where you could go and just um, map out um, plots of land and then just on the blockchain you can go and say who owns it. Sure, it may not be that useful, but it would just be an example of how you would do this. Um, and so you could go and um, have all of the plots of land listed up on the blockchain and then just say, okay, you need to trade uh, 10 diamonds to be able to go and claim ownership of this plot of land. Once you've done that, um, the blockchain will go and record that um, Steve is now the owner of this. Um, and then Steve can go and 
transfer it across. Uh, the reason I'd like to build this is to try and help students who are using this for education, try to help them understand um, blockchain and asset ownership and things like that. Um, another good example could be something like Second Life. So Second Life came out, um, I looked it up, it came out a decade ago now. Um, it unfortunately didn't live up to his, all, the, all the expectations. Um, I think it came out a bit too early. But for those who don't know, in Second Life, um, you, can, you can own land, as in real money for land. It's got a whole economy inside of it where you go and spend real money to go and purchase digital avatars and that that people have created themselves. Um, and some of those plots of land are going for, what, $50,000, uh, for example. So tracking some of that on the blockchain and uh, being able to pass on to other people is another example. So if we can combine some of this together where we've got um, digital ownership of um, digital plots of land inside of a metaverse, you've now got digital items that you could go and sell and consumables and that. So if we combine them together, someone may be able to um, own a plot of digital land, they go and set up their own um, bar, people can come in, they spend their real world money to go and buy these virtual items which they can then go and consume. So multiple ways to combine these together. So I've got five minutes left and about 100 more slides. So um, that's why I put all the corporate stuff at the end in case we run out of time. So we can combine a whole bunch of these to try and expand out a games um, ecosystem. So a great one would be around identity and reputation. So we've got, at the moment, lots of silos of identity and reputation. We've got, say, League of Legends, um, your current um, identity in that game and your reputation and your ladder score. Then we've got, um, same with Dota, then we've got it with Xbox Live. So in Xbox Live you've got your reputation score and if you're bad you go down and if you're okay you stay okay. But um, you can still be a bad person on one of those and just do a whole lot of trolling but then jump over to the other one and not be affected. So we could go and set up, like I mentioned before, with a eSports blockchain. We could do the same thing here, where the reputation on one game is brought across. They're going really well on Overwatch. They're up in um, Diamond League and um, Overwatch. In League of Legends, they're going okay. So they can have a more of a um, score. And if they start being toxic, then it penalizes them across the board. Um, so you, this will work well online with, say, digital marketplaces. We have eBay and Etsy. Um, where they've got, you've got different um, seller scores. So if we could have a um, global, uh, global digital-wide um, reputation score, so you as a seller, can, you can keep your reputation. Um, so this was around um, game ownership. So you could, at the moment, if we look at, say, Steam or Xbox, I I shouldn't say Xbox, I'm from Microsoft. Let's say Steam. So with Steam, you've got, um, they say which, which games you own, and Steam were to go down, all of those games that you own, you no longer own. And that's always been one of the big things with DRM. Hey, if I buy this music from, say, Microsoft Groove, and Groove stops being a service, um, then what happened to that music or these games? If we can't laugh at ourselves, then. <laughs> And so we could go, when, when people buy these games now, we could go and track in the blockchain that the person owns this game. So it would be great for indie titles, um, for indie titles where they, you can buy it once and it's uh, DRM free, but you can, okay, fine, I'm putting DRM on it. But um, you can prove that, um, that they've purchased a game and they own it. And they can use it on whatever platform that they want as long as um, they've logged in and shown that they own it. Um, and the game studio can go away and it's okay because that smart contract is still living on there forever and your game 20 years from now can still just load up and see that they still did own, own a copy of the game and they can still play it long after your game studio is gone. Um, it means we can go back to things where we would buy the physical game cartridge and we'd be able to hand it over to our friends or resell it in the second hand market. All this stuff we can now re-enable by putting game ownership onto the blockchain as a dig digital token asset. We can now go and loan it to our friend and put into a smart contract, hey, lend this to my friend for a week and we don't have to wait for our friend to give it back to us because a smart contract would just go and reassign it back to us after a week. So we've all had those friends who would borrow games and never give them back. Um, and again, second-hand markets, all this other type of things we can re-enable now. And this is what gets me excited about the blockchain. We can go and do this all again. It's no longer those um, big AAA gaming studios taking the power away from us. 
any developers, we can get that back again. Um, Esports, I've talked about that a, a couple of times now, but there is um, a blockchain app called First Blood coming out, which is around um, tokens that you earn for playing online games and winning. So kind of like uh, wagering um, online to tokens. And so if your team wins, you earn more tokens. Uh, people will spectate in the game can wager the tokens. Um, and the last gaming example that I've got that I'll close off with them is um, EVE Online. So EVE Online kind of has aspects of all of this. You've got digital um, items that people own and some of those big um, titans uh, were worth, what, $5,000 or something like that, some of those ships are worth. Um, and when people blow them up, it's a big deal. Um, so we've got digital items, but one of the things I used to love about EVE Online is that they had a kind of an open API. It had this rich ecosystem of people who are in the clans and guilds. They would go and use the API to go and build up their own clan website where they could go hit the API, see um, the list of all the people in their clans, so they could go and give them access to their Trello, um, Ventrilo accounts. Um, they could go and um, pull in the API information about um, uh, what's currently being listed on the market, that type of stuff. But it was still the EVE Online developers who would just um, be gatewaying what you were allowed to do and they were very, very slow ever, ever updating the API to allow you to do more things. But we could now go and instead of waiting for them, we've seen some examples of digital items and land ownership and transferring and trading and reputation scores. We can combine all of this into whatever will be the next um, big EVE Online, which will probably be the next Second Life um, game that comes out where now, once we've got just um, the base uh, contracts exposed, which is who owns these digital items, who owns whatever, boom, we can now build this rich ecosystem around it. And you'll be having everyone else in the community leveraging this and building things for you, which will enrich your game, which is, what, which is where EVE Online, um, uh, which is what made it successful um, 10 years back. Um, so now people can go and build up those third-party trading websites. They can build up uh, wagering sites. They can go and build up other little mini micro games based on your digital assets. Um, so they can go and build Farmville based on whatever, um, how many cows you actually own inside of EVE Online because you can buy livestock in EVE Online. So you can combine multiple of these things together. Uh, actually, I do have two minutes. So what I would just say is on Azure, we, we, we have the blockchains. So all of the blockchains that exist, um, all the major ones, Ethereum, Corda, Hyperledger, Chain, Strata, blah, 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 we've got them all up on there. The idea is you can go and say, hey, create me a prototyping uh, test net. You click go, it creates all the virtual machines for you up in a nice blockchain network. Um, you get some pretty dashboards so you can see a blockchain is blockchaining. Um, biggest thing is, uh, so I use Visual Studio Code. Uh, Visual Studio Code runs on Windows, Mac, and on Linux. And so I do all of my smart contract developments inside of here. And so last weekend, I was um, helping some people who were coding on Macs, on VS Code, do a smart, smart contract development, which we pushed up into Azure. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, Windows 10, you can natively run um, Ubuntu Linux applications on top of Windows 10 now. It's not a virtual machine. It's running natively on top of the Windows NT core, um, NT, NT kernel. Pretty cool. Um, and so all of the blockchain development that I do, I do inside of Windows 10, inside of Ubuntu Bash Shell, using VS Code in my UI, but I'm using um, Node and NPM inside of Linux, and it all just works. It's really cool. Um, you can still put the DevOps around it. So every time we check in smart contracts, we've got all of these unit tests to go over it all to make sure that um, I haven't put a vulnerability into my code. Uh, because if you mess up your smart contract, um, you don't get a second chance. People can go and take out all of your Bitcoin or all of your digital assets and poof, they're gone. Um, and if you're interested, there's a whole bunch of meetups around Australia. So with that gives us me five minutes then to take questions, um, if we have questions. But I'll, I'll leave, I'll let you guys take a photo of that, and I'll leave it with that. So, cool. Thanks, guys. If you have questions, um, put your hand up and go check and go.
Yo. How, how are smart contracts designed so they're not hackable statistics? <laughs> that, that, that's the real the, the point of those vulnerabilities. Sure, sure. Well, it's just like any piece of code, what you do to make it not hackable. So a lot of things around. Um, so a lot of things around smart contracts when I go into companies and help them develop them is think of them as if they are safety critical code. So same thing if this was running a piece of big heavy machinery where people could get something cut off, safety critical code there or in medical devices where if it just messes up once, a lot of bad stuff will happen. Same thing here. So it's a lot of defensive stuff, um, a lot of uh, um, assertions within your code. So um, not just assertions that are in the units has to assert that this is correct or true, but actually inside of each of um, your smart contract methods, you actually have an assert at the very beginning where you're asserting that the values that are coming in are within the range that we would expect. So straight away you try and protect yourself from um, out of bound issues. Um, when you go and do um, an addition or something like that, you go and do an assert that um, first number plus uh, we're well, doing uh, variable plus equals a second variable. You do that, but then you do an assert that says that um, this one should now be bigger than what that one was. Because if it's not, we just had a um, buffer overflow and something's wrong. So we put a lot of asserts throughout our code just to uh, sanity check what we expected to happen did happen. If it didn't, just throw an exception right now, stop right now. Um, so programming th things in that way. Another way is... Um, a lot of us going back to early programming, which is why I love it, because back to the nice, simple, self-contained things that you can just test and make sure that they work well. And so using state machines, state machines work really well. Um, we'll get out uh, 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 big whiteboards and we'll go and just draw state machines, what things should look like. So an item has been created, um, and an item is in the created state, an item can um, uh, have a material applied to it, so now it's in a um, modified state. It can be uh, damaged, just now in a disrepaired state, or something like that, where each of the functions within a smart contract reacts. Uh, you can only call if this smart contract is in a certain state. So it works well with um, contracts to do a uh, item transfer or something like that. So you're opening up a new trade, so the smart contract is in a open for trade. Um, so you can only call the uh, add items to this trade while it's in the open. Once you're in the um, sub, um, submitted for acceptance, now you can no longer modify that trade. So all of the other uh, function calls will fail. Um, once the other party has accepted, the, um, the contract will go over to a uh, finalised and accepted state. So the only, only method that will work is going to be the um, um, extract out the items, but all the other functions don't work anymore. So a combination of, yeah, lots of asserts, um, state machines, um, and yeah, safety critical programming. Well, those are the, the ways that we've been doing it so far. But this is such a brand new field that best, new best practices are coming out every couple of months. This is such an emerging field at the moment. Um, what about a non-persistent implementation? Like you've got a multiplayer game with dozens of creatures running around hmm. and you assign ownership of those creatures to players based on proximity to distribute the processing. Could you use blockchaining so that people can authoritatively grab different creatures and you can't have someone pack in and say, well, all these ships are mine, run right towards my player so I can have them. And that's not stored permanently, it's just kind of in a, inside of a game session. So if it's not s stored permanently... So um, for those who couldn't hear, the question was, um, we've, we care about for the... For the life of this single game game um, session, uh, who the owners are of these different cattle or something like that, but we only care for the lifetime of that game. Once that game's gone, then um, we don't care, but we still, for the lifetime of that game, want to prove yeah. who the owner is. Um, I don't... Th so I probably wouldn't do it that way because you'd just be clogging up the blockchain with lots of stuff. So you can put stuff onto the blockchain, um, and so you have to... Whenever you're putting new stuff into the blockchain, you have to pay money to go and persist stuff into the blockchain. Um, and so you're going to be paying money to put it in every time. So... Sure, sure. So, but then um, if you have a local implementation, is it just on um, one server? And if it is, then it's no different from a database. So, 
Yeah, so it gets, um, and so this is where I see a lot of th companies go wrong. They go, oh, okay, I'm going to have run a uh, private blockchain all by myself. And so they've got their um, front end server, the back end server, and then a blockchain. But no one cares because um, anyone who comes in, um, it, it could just be a database for all they know. If it's just um, a single company hosting their own on a single node, um, just use a database. It's going to be faster, you're going to have less headaches. Blockchain only makes sense where you have multiple parties or you need to go and prove to other people um, things around yeah, who ownership. But if it's just a single company doing it and you're going through the API calls anyway, it can be a database because it's the API call who's um, giving you the source of truth at the moment. Absolutely. They could validate each other's things. So no one could, like if this guy just said, oh, I actually own all the cattle, the other ones would be like, well, no, you don't. Hmm. Um, yes, although then you've got a consensus algorithm, so you might want to look at like consensus algorithms in military stuff rather than a blockchain, I'm not sure. Because hmm. you're just doing it in flight, right? You don't need the stored ledger, so, hmm. yeah. Yeah, um, and another thing to remember is with blockchain um, reading, you can read the current state whenever you want, but um, pushing in a transaction to go and modify the state, you have to wait until the next block happens. And so you can't use it for anything that's uh, like a first person shooter, real time, every time you shoot a person going and tracking that they took that point of damage. No, if you're going to be shooting, you're going to be waiting 30 seconds until the next block's been mined, so that won't work. So it works for things like um, item assets and land ownership and things where you can have that little bit of latency between they submit go and record this, and then something happens. So opening up loot crates and the result of that loot crate happens, sure, that works well. Um, putting the, the, the loot crate logic into a smart contract onto a blockchain, even better, because now they don't have to trust that um, uh, Blizzard says that the drop rate on the loot crates are like 5% for this and 10% for that, and then when people buy 10,000 crates and they don't get it, they don't go, oh yeah, there was a bug, we got the percentages wrong, whoops. They, it's all codified inside of a smart contract, and so you can put um, the random number generator, you can put the um, what the percentages are, so 1% um, for the super shiny epic, 50% uh, for the commons, but it's all there, and every time someone buys a new smart con uh, buys a new loot crate, they know and they can prove that it's being done fairly, and then straight away, the results of that loot box goes and it gets assigned straight to their personal wallet. So, lots of other ways. Uh, okay, that one. Oh, sorry, yeah, here we go. Um, yeah, so in, the, in your land ownership uh, example, like Minecraft, hmm. uh, who's providing the blocks, right? Like hmm. in, in your sure, so in that one I was going to use uh, one of the existing, uh, the public Ethereum network. So okay. I was just going to yeah. do that. So I would have to have my, my server running there that's going in, um, just going from the Minecraft server to my API, and then my API will have my um, Ethereum wallet, so then I'll just pay for the things to do it. So in that case, uh, again, it's not truly decentralized because it's going to go through my API, so I could use a database. But the advantage of it is because it's on a blockchain, people can still go and just use a blockchain explorer and go and look who's the current owner of these things. So outside of Minecraft, they'll still be able to view and verify that they do own it. Um, you could go and modify the Minecraft um, client software, so the one that runs on your local machine, so it goes and does some... Um, uh, blockchain lookups and go and do that and go and pull it down so they can go and see who the owner is but you're still going to need the server to go and say can they go and build on this plot of land so there are multiple ways you could implement this it's all about um, at which point you want to have the blockchain connection on the, just on the server side or on inside the clients or in the yeah lots of engineering does Bitcoin and Ethereum share the same ledger and mining resources or do they our question was, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum, do they share the same... No, they, sh they share nothing. Sh share nothing. So they're very, very different technologies. Um, Bitcoin has uh, is a system called UXTO, um, Unspent Transaction Outputs. So the idea is you can go and track uh, this coin and got split up into multiple fragments. And you can um, this current coin that you've got, you can go and see the bits where it came from. Whereas um, Ethereum is... Have, because it was built with smart contracts in mind, it's done as in, uh, individual transaction calls. You can go and go and call a smart contract, go and transfer these um, ether to someone else, go and do something. So they're uh, completely different networks, very different technology, uh, very diff different implementations. 
Uh, but again, Bitcoin is 1.0 technology, so you can't build up applications easily on it. Whereas Ethereum, because of those smart contracts, um, where was it? Yeah, last weekend, um, I had uh, 70 people in a room. We were building out, um, it was just a three-day hackathon where we just went and just built out blockchain stuff for fun for three days. Um, and so in those, in the first, because of the tooling and scaffolding that we've got, um, the first five minutes, we've got a basic scaffold with a basic web UI there, which is going storing stuff in the um, blockchain. Um, and so I helped, um, there were a couple of students there, and so I helped one of them build something for um, environmental sensors. So proving that the um, environmental data is true and correct and Trump hasn't gone in to try to modify the <laughs> climate change data. And so it was just um, every periodically the IoT sensor would just go um, call into the blockchain and just say, hey, please put this um, reading into the blockchain, please put that reading into the blockchain. And she'd never used blockchain before and she had most of that um, written up in five, six hours. So you can do some of the stuff easy once you know what you're doing. Cool. So I think we've got the, uh, you can come up and ask me ask, um, later, but I better let you guys go so you can go to the keynote. So thanks, everyone. <laughs>